So now it's my pleasure. Uh, we will dive into the emergent molecular mechanism and therapies in cancer and GVHD. Please welcome our next session chair, Dr. Charles Greener, Alfred Mann Family Foundation Chair and Professor of the Department of Diabetes and Cancer Metabolism at City of Hope. Dr. Brenner obtained his PhD in cancer biology from Stanford University and completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Brandeis University. Before joining City of Hope in 2020, Dr. Brenner served as a Roy Carver Chair and Head of the Department of Biochemistry, Professor of Internal Medicine, and Founding Director at the University of Iowa Obesity Initiative. He has received various prestigious award of fellowships including the Mary Swartz Rose Senior Investigator Award from the, the American Society of Nutrition. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed publications in journals, including Cell, Science, and the Proceeding of the National Academy of Science, and holds multiple patents. So welcome, Dr. Brenner. Thanks so much, Dr. Xiao. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the speakers for this session. And uh, First speaker is colleague uh, Dustin Shones, who's an associate professor here at City of Hope. Um, he obtained his PhD at Sony Brook, completed his postdoctoral fellowship at National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH. Um, he received the L'Enfant Biomedical Fellowship and NIH Fellows Award for Research Excellence, highly published um, in all the right places. and. Since joining City of Hope, he's been investigating how epigenetic modifications are influenced by environmental factors such as diet, um, metals, viral infections, and then potentially even reversible by activity. So I'm really excited to see your, your talk, Dustin. The floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to talk here today. I'm um, excited to share a little bit about what we've been doing over the last few years. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna to talk today about um, epigenomes in cancer and some of their unique characteristics. And then I'm also gonna talk about how um, epigenetic modifications provide a molecular link between other metabolic diseases like diabetes and obesity and cancer. Um, so I'm gonna start with a, a brief introduction into um, epigenetics and epigenomes. Uh, and then uh, dive into some of our more recent work uh, in this space. So the human genome is packaged into the nucleus um, by wrapping the genome around collections of histone proteins to, to form nucleosomes. Um, and this overall structure here is, is generally referred to as a chromatin structure. Uh, and this um, structure is subject to a wide array of modifications. Um, and these are generally now referred to as epigenetic modifications. And the collection of these modifications across the genome is generally what we refer to as an epigenome. So there's many different types of epigenetic modifications, um, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'm really just gonna focus on a couple of these. Um, and that's going to be on uh, post-translational modifications to histone proteins themselves. Um, and then also the direct modification of DNA and specifically in terms of DNA methylation. So an important point to consider is that while most of the cells um, in a given individual have just uh, the, you know, the same genome, every unique cell um, in, uh, in an individual has its own epigenome. Um, and the, this, this epigenome uh, serves several important functions. Um, one, it just helps to compact the genome into the nucleus and, and protect um, an underlying DNA from any sort of um, uh, adverse events. Um, the, this packaging system generally results in the repression of the vast majority of the genome. Um, but it has to do this in a matter which allows the correct genes to be turned on at the correct times to make a heart cell a heart, heart cell or a, a liver cell a liver cell. Um, and this has to be done um, in a, um, a, in a a way that allows it to be replicated, stable cell type, cell type specific patterns. Um, and um, this, is, this is what the central function of epigenetic modifications um, are, are doing. So in a normal healthy somatic cell, we generally think of chromatin modifications as being either compatible with transcription, which we generally refer to as active modifications or incompatible with transcription, um, which we call repressive modifications. 
So the vast majority of any given epigenome um, is this repressive um, all the chunk right here. And that's because most of your genome is made up of repetitive elements, um, genomic parasites that can have pretty nasty outcomes if they become active. Um, and you know, from, from this perspective, the, ma the major function of epigenetic modifications in the genome um, is to silence these repetitive elements. Um, but a consequence of that is that these epigenetic modifications um, are intimately involved in regulating uh, protein coding genes as well. Um, so what happens in cancer is that the situation gets flipped um, and regions which are normally transcribed in, in a healthy cell um, can become silenced. So they lose their um, ability to, to be protected from the silencing. And this, is, uh, this has been observed at say tumor suppressor genes, for example. And then on the other side of this, the, the rest of the genome, which should be repressed in, um, in normal cells, uh, starts to lose this repression to an extent. And, and this can result in aberrant transcriptional profiles and um, loss of cellular identity. So metabolic diseases have been linked uh, with cancer for, for decades now. People have been examining the, the link between diabetes and cancer. And I, more recently, it's become clear that obesity um, is a risk factor for many types of cancer as well. Um, for this talk, we'll, I'll consider that um, diabetes and cancer have very similar metabolic characteristics. They both have altered glucose metabolism with the, the, the net result being different. You know, in diabetes, chronic hyperglycemia leads to general deterioration of tissues, um, whereas in, in cancer, um, this can fuel uncontrolled cell growth. Um, and there's a, a couple of pretty well-characterized molecular mechanisms um, for, for which this can happen. Um, so uh, for example, hyperglycemia, um, through the hexosamine uh, biosynthesis pathway um, can produce um, UDP glicnac. And this is actually the, the substrate for o glicnacylation, which is uh, a, a, pr a protein uh, translational modification that is known to impact many different proteins. Um, it's been shown that the increased levels of o glicnacylation can result in increased DNA damage and KRAS mutations in, in pancreatic cancer. And I'm going to focus a little bit later on some of the some of the work we've been doing and looking how oglignacylation of epigenetic regulatory proteins uh, impacts um, epigenetic modifications uh, in um, in uh, in disease settings. Um, other other well characterized pathways such as hyperinsulinemia um, activates insulin receptor, which can stimulate MAPK PI3K pathways, resulting in uh, increased cell growth and proliferation signals. Um, so why am I introducing these links between cancer and diabetes in a, uh, a talk focused on epigenetic uh, modifications? And it's because the substrates for many of these epigenetic modifications are controlled by metabolic pathways. So just a, a couple of examples here, um, acetyl-CoA uh, extension of, of what we were just talking about, insulin signaling, results in a signaling cascade through these uh, PI3K AKT pathways. This will in induce mTOR signaling, and um, uh, this is going to stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis, um, increase TCA cycle, and the, the net output of this is acetyl-CoA, which is the, the prime substrate for um, histone acetylation, um, which is a, a, a chromatin modification that I'm going to talk about um, some of our work related to in just a minute. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, SAM the, 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 is the substrate for um, both DNA and, and histone methylation. And this is synthesized from methionine and ATP one carbon metabolism. So a lot of um, the, the, the substrates that are uh, important for these epigenetic modifications are produced or regulated by these metabolic pathways. So we, we started recently, um, well, a few years ago now, working with um, Dr. Vicki Seewald's lab at City of Hope and her group. And they've been working at the interface of diabetes and cancer um, for some time, particularly focused on aggressive cancers, um, such as triple negative breast cancer. Um, so these triple negative breast cancers are a diverse group of cancers, um, but they're characterized by a lack of expression of the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and um, lacking the ERBB2 or HER2 amplification. So there's a high prevalence of TNBCs in women of African descent, um, and as well as um, 
younger European women that have mutations in, in BRCA1. Um, so African-American women have higher overall breast cancer mortality compared with women of European descent. And there's many factors for this, um, uh, including disparities in income, access to healthy food, uh, health care, lack of exercise. And, and many of these disparities uh, actually lead to comorbid diseases such as diabetes and obesity. And, and Vicki and her colleagues have proposed several um, models by where, whereby diabetes and obesity can promote TNBC through several uh, molecular mechanisms. So um, Perjat uh, Senapati, who is a, a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, um, started working on a, a project in collaboration with Vicky's lab on all this. Um, so I mentioned a few slides ago that insulin signaling results in the production of more subtle CoA through a, a series of uh, uh, signaling cascades. And we wondered if this might result in changes to histone acetylation patterns. So um, what I'm showing you here, this has all been published for a couple of years now, so I'm just gonna show you one quick data slide. Um, what I'm showing you here is we have peripheral blood mononuclear, mononuclear cells, um, some blood cells isolated from both insulin resistant and insulin sensitive individuals. And uh, what we did is we measured the uh, acetylation of histone H3 lysine 9 um, using Western blot analysis and an antibody directed against this specific mark. Um, and what we were able to see was that these insulin resistant in individuals um, had an increase in H3K9 acetylation signal. So there's a lot of other work in this paper. Um, we looked at the impact of histone, so these uh, differences in histone acetylation on gene expression and transcriptional profiles. Um, uh, but the other thing I wanna point out is that um, the, the chromatin structure itself uh, is important for protecting the underlying DNA, um, as I mentioned. And uh, we also looked for uh, markers of DNA damage, specifically gamma H2X here, and measuring that in exactly the same way we did for H3K9 acetylation, we saw in the same situations where we have increased H3K9 um, acetylation, the insulin resistant individuals, we see um, increased um, gamma H2X, uh, so indicating more um, loci with DNA damage markers. Uh, uh, so, this allows us to sort of continue this model um, where we, we've known for some time that um, insulin signaling um, generates this cascade resulting in increased acetyl-CoA. And, and we've been able to show that this does result in changes to histone acetylation across the genome, um, alters transcriptional profiles, and um, does result in increased signals for DNA damage as well. So for the remaining time, that I have today, I'm gonna to shift gears from histone modifications and, and, and go back to DNA methylation. Um, so in mammalian genomes, DNA methylation is mostly at uh, CG dinucleotides. Um, there are more exotic types of DNA methylation, but this is by far the most prevalent. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's established de novo in development by the de novo methyltransferases, uh, primarily DNMT3A and 3B, um, resulting in the addition of this methyl group to, to the cytosine. And then this is maintained in replication through this maintenance methyl transferase DNA, DNMT1. So in a standard um, healthy somatic cell, um, most of the, the, the genome is methylated. Most CPGs um, are, are going to be methylated because again, the, most of the genome is made up of these repetitive regions that um, the, the, the cell wants to keep silenced. And the exception to this rule is at um, uh, these very dense regions of, or very CPG dense regions that we call CPG islands. Um, and these are generally um, uh, protected from methylation. There's proteins that can recognize unmethylated CPG dense sequences. They bind here and prevent DNMTs um, from methylating these. And um, that, that results in these being like the, the only regions of the genome you, you generally don't find methylation in a a healthy somatic cell. Uh, so the in cancer, the situation, uh, like I mentioned before, it is sort of flipped. And these CPG islands can start to lose protection um, from silencing and become methylated. And then also there's a general loss of methylation um, across the whole genome. Um, and it, it, we do know that some of these general hypomethylated uh, regions um, can have hypermethylated uh, genes that, that sit within them. 
So more recently, we've we started to realize uh, that this general loss of methylation that's um, that we've been observing in, in cancer cells um, doesn't happen just randomly across the genome, but it's happening in these broad sort of megabase size domains where there is a reliable um, partial loss of methylation um, that, that can vary. Uh, and these have been referred to as partially methylated domains. Um, so I should explain what this is. So this is a, a data from a paper that's now, uh, well, a decade old. I mean, what they did is they, they profiled DNA methylation in um, uh, ESCs, uh, normal colon, um, this is the methylation profile across this locus here. And you can see they repeated that in, in colon and tumor cells. And they see these, these general dips that are domain sized or, or megabase domain sized um, that have lost methylation. And these also uh, have, have been seen in um, immortalized uh, cells as well. Uh, and the, the very first uh, uh, studies into this saw that these coincide with regions of late replication and nuclear lamina. And again, they, they, they can contain regions of focal hypermethylation at genes that sit in these regions. So more recently, pe uh, people have started to look at this across um, uh, many different cells. And so this is uh, data looking at DNA methylation across 30 different primary um, breast cancer cells. And uh, these uh, highlighted regions here are, are characterized breast cancer PMDs. And you can see they're not at all uniform uh, across the different samples. So there's some sort of stochasticity that's happening um, in the, the development and maintenance of these partially methylated domains. So we don't know how these occur. Um, one sort of obvious potential culprit is there's imperfect maintenance of methylation during replication, um, but this has not been worked out yet. And it's interesting that um, these domains seem to maintain a, a sort of equilibrium level of methylation um, uh, uh, across cell divisions. So sometimes, you know, it, there's regions that are just completely lost, and that seems to maintain that that complete loss. And and similarly, if there's just you know a fifty percent loss, that also seems to be maintained um, across cell divisions. And um, the the mechanisms for this are, are completely unclear. Um, so. We've been curious about, about this for a while now. And um, uh, a few years ago now, um, uh, Dr. Han Shin uh, joined my lab as a postdoctoral fellow, and he had actually done his graduate training um, in oncolytic inoculation biology. And um, he, uh, around this time also, there was, there was a, uh, a large uh, screening type paper that was published showing that many epigenetic regulator proteins, um, including DNA methyltransferases, could be oglycnacolated. Um, so he wanted to ask, you know, is, is the oglycnacolation of these proteins doing anything um, to methylomes? And uh, uh, so he started uh, looking through this and um, uh, starting with just PBMCs um, from a few donors, um, he treated these, these cells with increasing concentrations of glucose um, and was able to see that uh, increasing concentrations of glucose uh, resulted in increased amounts of oglycnacolation of DNMT1. Um, this is uh, this is a representative blot from from one of the donors, and then this is quantifying those blots across um, uh, the the rest of the donors here. And then uh, he wanted to find uh, figure out if he could find where in DNMT1 the the, the oglycnacolation was having the the biggest effect. And so he started by using a, a computational approach um, called OGT site. And, and what this does is it uses um, experimentally verified um, oblique nucleation sites to build models of like, motifs of that um, are, are more most likely to be modified. Um, and this resulted in a, a couple of dozen uh, sites um, that could potentially be oblique nucleated. But then we just went ahead and did the, the mass spec. Uh, we collaborated with the mass spectrometry proteomics court city of hope and uh, performed mass spec to um, to to find the sites um, the exam to look at all the ptms into tmt1 and this resulted in this particular um, location here s878 as being the the, the most uh, major site of oblique methylation so then han started making alanine uh, mutants um, alanine cannot be oblique methylated um, examining the, the oblate inoculation of DNMT1 at these different alanine um, 
mutations. And this analysis indicated that the T158A and that S878 um, A are also are the, are the prime candidates for oblique neck lesion. So it's interesting, this 878 is actually in the BH1 domain and BAH domains are known to be um, required for the methyltransferase activity of TMT1. So with that, Hans started looking at the, 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 methylase, the methyltransferase activity of DNMT1. Um, and this is going back to the, the same PBMC, PBMC samples that I showed you before. And he observed that with the increase of oblique inflation of DNMT1, uh, we saw a, a corresponding a loss of activity uh, of DNMT1. Um, so he then went on to, to look at sort of the the dynamics of this between low and high glucose conditions for both the wild type and the various mutants. Um, so low glucose here, um, at five millimeters, and then for high glucose, uh, we're combining it with a thiamate, thiamate G treatment, uh, which uh, the TMG is an inhibitor of OGA, which is the oglignase, uh, which removes oglignac. And the reason we do this is to sort of not dilute the signal. Um, so OGA isn't removing the oglignac before we have a chance to measure it. And we did check the enzyme activity of OGT, OGA, and they don't see having any differences um, across glucose conditions. So our 588A here looks a lot like wild type, um, indicating that the, the oglignac is, is not um, impacting DNMT1 activity, but our S78A mutant um, it does not have loss. So that is the, the, the best candidate for oglignac collation um, affecting um, methyltransferase activity. So this, this uh, has also been shown to be phosphorylated. And so Han used a, a phosphorylated mutant um, S878D that can't be oglycnacylated. Um, and, and this does not have any loss of activity. So it really is just the oglycnacylation um, of this residue. So I know I'm running very short on time, uh, but um, lastly, we, we looked at the epigenome. So we did denomethylation profiling for wild type and the S878A mutant cells under both low and high glucose conditions. And what we saw um, immediately when we started looking at these, um, we look at a lot of genome browser tracks and uh, we, we generally refer to this as doing bioinformatics. And just by bioinformatics, we could very obviously see that there was a, a loss of methylation at very broad domains that looked a lot like partially methylated domains. And so we started um, intersecting this with previously existing data, um, in this case, the liver, tumor, partially methylated domains, and we saw there was a very strong overlap. Um, and uh, we quantified that. Uh, so the, if we compare regions within PMDs to background under both low and high glucose, the, the PMD regions are preferentially losing methylation um, in these cells, and this is reversed in the mutants. Um, so I know I'm a little bit over time, so just I'll summarize the model. High glucose leads to oglycnaculation of DNMT1. It inhibits DMT function and results in loss of methylation at cancer-specific PMDs. Um, I've tried to acknowledge the people as I've gone. The, these projects were led by a couple of postdocs in the lab, Han Shin and Parajat Sanapati, um, close collaborations with, with Vicky Seawalt, and also I think the funding. Uh, and thank you all for your time. Okay, that was pretty darn exciting. Um, we're going to hold questions uh, for the end. We've got two more talks. So I'm going to um, introduce talk two. Um, it's going to be from my co-leader of the um, MCBC program, Dr. Bing Shen. He's professor and chair of cancer genetics and epigenetics. And um, he obtained his PhD in molecular genetics from Kansas State. He did his postdoc at UC Irvine and Los Alamos National Laboratories. And um, he came to City of Hope in 1996. And, you know, he's just one of the world leaders in replication repair. He first established the DNA2 mouse model, and uh, he's an elected member of the AAAS Fellows. And he's gonna to talk to us about um, some beautiful work that he published in a science paper last year on Okazaki fragment maturation, life, death, or mutagenesis. Go ahead, Bing. Thank you, uh, Charles. Uh, that's a very generous uh, introduction. 
as the DNA replication is uh, so relevant to uh, cancer etiology and also cancer treatment. So I will uh, uh, deliver some of the basic knowledge about DNA replication, even though it's uh, like a very classical topic, but uh, I will show you know, some of the new data we have recently published and to refresh it, but particularly try to emphasize the, how the cancer still survives under the oncogenic treatment. Next slide. This is uh, an oversimplified DNA replication fork models that, um, as you see, the leading strand of DNA synthesis is uh, continuously as yes, a polymerase epsilon to, as a major polymerase to extend the DNA as yes, uh, the mother DNA, single strand DNA as a template. But the lagging strand DNA synthesis has a provenance as all the polymerase goes from five prime to three prime that uh, why the DNA replication move in, um, in one direction. The, the, the polymerase uh, data has to synthesize DNA a fragment by a fragment. Actually, in order to synthesize DNA in novo, it has to use a primase to add a patch of the RNA, short patch of RNA first. And then DNA polymerase alpha take over to synthesize uh, uh, another piece of DNA, which is synthesized by polymerase alpha, and then polymerase uh, delta take over to synthesize a longer piece. So these all three fragments come together as a, a alkazic fragment, uh, you know, called alkazic fragment. And the like strain is, uh, connecting all these uh, fragments together as a longer strain. So DNA polymerase can, DNA replication can move from one direction. And the question is uh, how alkalic fragment is maturated, how can it uh, move, you know, put together. So uh, because the, the polymerase, uh, Primase and polymerase alpha has no proof leading function. So actually, this is uh, represent a uh, repair opportunity where we remove the RNA primer and the uh, alpha cell fragment. Next slide. So Tom Conkel actually is a pioneer just to count the, um, this mechanism of the fragment synthesized by different polymerase and uh, the mutation frequency, how they spontaneously introduce the mutation into alkalic fragment maturation. So he counted you know, different uh, polymerases and the error rate for incorporation could be you know, hundred fold difference, particularly because the pol alpha and the primase does not have a proof leading function, uh, missing the three prime nucleases. So that is uh, the the difference uh, the count because it adds nucleotide on and uh, just go on without a proof leading, so there's no function to remove the mismatch uh, a base pair. Next slide. And of course, we have a DNA repair systems to keep the fidelity, high fidelity of the newly synthesized DNA. Uh, so. This system was well characterized uh, by Dr. Paul Modric um, and many other people in our field. And uh, uh, because of this work, Dr. Modric won Nobel Prize in 2016. Next slide. However, one problem we found is that the, the mutation is not evenly distributed in the whole genome. They are, you know, the peak of the mutation frequency as expressed in the poly polymorphisms late here is very well matched with the alkalic fragment a junction rate, junction size. It's a, it's a peak is very well matched here. And also this peak is in center of nucleosome. So the protein binding uh, makes difference. So polymerase alpha and primase incorporate many more mutations, errors due to lack of the proof leading function as I pointed out, and it's in the occasional junction site. 
And these uh, organic fragment maturation also can make errors because it has a competition between the organic fragment maturation machinery and also the nucleus assembly. In other words, if the nucleus is already binding to the newly synthesized DNA, then the, the, the shield, the, the, the machinery cannot, nucleus cannot remove errors anymore. Next slide. So one of the major nucleus involved in alkazaka fragment maturation is called FLAP endonucleus 1, the enzyme I have been spending the last 25 years on, on it. So, so this enzyme is a, a, a new concept that the nucleus does not recognize the sequence, but recognize the conformation of the DNA substrate. The typical substrate is a flap uh, nucleus. It's like a, in surgical operation that you make a flap. So, uh, and uh, this uh, enzyme itself uh, uh, in the center has a hole. This hole is uh, large enough for single strand DNA to slide through, but not double strand DNA. So that explains some of the specificity why it's recognized uh, three prime single strand. Uh, five prime single strand flap. And this enzyme even don't recognize three prime flap. And there's two uh, enzyme activities. One is uh, called flap endonucleus activities, as uh, called the NIC specific exonucleus activities from the NIC point. It will remove the nucleus one by one. So this is called from the end, it's called exonucleus activity. So um, in next few slides, uh, next slide, please. I will, uh, uh, you know, I explain the mechanism, but also mutation consequence if the, this deficiency of this enzyme. Actually, Colonel was the first one knocked out the, uh, the, the gene from yeast. And he see a dramatically increase of the mutation frequency, more like a, you know, a hundred fold above the background. So it's more like mismatch repair genes. However, he said, no, it's not mismatch repair gene. It's the gene involving alkazaka fragment. It's a fixed in the structure instead of uh, you know, single nucleotide replacement substitution. It's a, it's, it's a fragment that the, the enzyme is uh, repairing. And if you knock out, you'll see all type of um, classic uh, duplication mutations. So repeat sequence. Uh, uh, is you know about more than 100 uh, nucleotide long fragment. So, uh, but on the other hand, there's about 30% of the mutations are point mutation. So, I, so, so where are those point mutations come from? Next slide. We did uh, some biochemical experiment and also yeast and mouse experiment to specifically uh, knock out the exo activity of uh, of the uh, flapendo nucleus. And I think we uh, count the exo activity actually is the one it's uh, remove those uh, errors, mismatch errors. Uh, so that is the other portion of the mutation comes from. And here we uh, designed some uh, uh, you know, smart, uh, <laughs> clever uh, AC systems that we wanted to build in a mismatch in downstream of the uh, flap and to see which enzyme is removed, is which activity actually. Um, so we, we assign this activity for exonucleus activity. Actually, if there's a mismatch, it will go down to remove this. And this is the GRS is a show the result, which will take a few minutes for me to explain, but uh, I will save the time for this. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the overall calculation of the mutation uh, consequence. Uh, in the DNA replication fork. So it's input by the polymerases. But some other polymerases, uh, you know, primase and polymerase alpha can input more errors because there is no proof leading function. So error frequency is pretty high. So the, the, the RNA primer as a whole is, uh, you know, high frequency is removed by RNA primer removal activity of the flap endonucleus. But uh, the 
Halo, the mutation, point mutation input by polymer alpha is removed by the alpha halo editing function of the flap endonuclease. So uh, that is the point I try to address. <clears throat> so this is some background in, uh, introduction. Uh, let me go through the uh, next session. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, the, the question is the how oxidic fragment maturation process implement and the DNA replication stress. For example, if I delete the flap endonuclease, and so, so the other phenotype I did not introduce when the fan wall is knocked out in yeast, it's become called um, conditional resolity. That, uh, that means in certain degree, the yeast's mutant cell can stay grow like more normally. But uh, if we lift the temperature to in certain cell degree, the white type of cell can stay survive, can stay grow just slowly. But uh, the mutant cell, fan wall mutant cell is the lethal. So this is called conditional resolity. Next slide. <clears throat> when we grow cell for longer time, you can see all the mutant uh, uh, lead 27 or fan one here. The cell is uh, very struggling. They are going to die. But if you incubate for longer time at 37 degree, some of the small colonies come up like this. And so take advantage of whole genome sequence. We, try to uh, sequence what's going on, to compare the, uh, the Y type, the mutant grow at 30 degree and 37 degree. So we want to see what occurred in the 37 degree, make those cell can survive if we uh, incubate them for longer time. And we come up with uh, seven gene mutations, uh, like 26 mutations, but in seven genes. But the one gene come up, very consistently is a polymerase, um, polymerase uh, delta. And the polymerase delta is a major enzyme synthesizes uh, ligand strand uh, DNA. And uh, this uh, mutation, so this uh, is a mutation, majority of the mutation in power delta is uh, duplication mutations. And we put this mutation back into the lab 27 mutants and different type of mutations, they can back up the phenotype for cell to grow like a normal. So this is a revertent, but the polymerase data is uh, the gene, it's the mutation, signal mutation on the top of the lab tendency mutation uh, is uh, the gene make the reversion. Next slide. What happens uh, in, you know, in molecular level? What we see here in this GR is that the, the, the Polymerase, uh, wild type polymerase can synthesize DNA like uh, in high processivity. So that's going on and on and actually can di displace the downstream RNA primers and synthesize DNA like a uh, very long. But uh, Milton cannot go on very long, very short. Like there's lost displacement, the problem. So still probably die because of this, uh, the flap. Now you don't have to displace this. It's a solve the problem. <clears throat> Next slide. And but the, the mutation we were seeing is a duplication mutation is gone, but the point mutation is still there. So if you look at the quickly in, in this three different situation, this is a mutation rate, and if we count for different type of mutation, we can see the duplication mutation in when you have a second mutation in polymer three, that they are gone. You know, when you have so, so many duplication mutations in the lab 27 mutation alone. And if you account for whole genome sequence, you also see, see the same result that the duplication mutation is gone. And that makes us to ask the next question, how the duplication mutation come from? Next slide. <clears throat> and a, we were looking into the whole genome rearrangement event through the whole genome sequence to, by informatic analysis for the lab 27 cells that is heat shocked at 37 degrees for four hours. Because if you uh, incubate the lung, the majority of cells will die. And um, the only few cells uh, survives 
that is uh, has a uh, polymerase mutation already. So we control the four hours. We want to look at the process where those event occurs, how the duplication mutation occurs. Next slide. <clears throat> when we did that, we found that uh, is a mutation at 37 degree, uh, like 27 mutation at 37 degree, all have lots of uh, duplication mutations. It's uh, over again. But uh, this duplication mutation is different from the classical duplication mutation we have been seeing that you know, repeat of these two sequences. Now you have extra sequence called spacer sequence, where spacer sequence come from. So uh, we call this type of the duplication mutation alternative duplication mutation. Next slide. <clears throat> the way we have the problem for five prime flat, sometimes in some cases actually is a, a five prime a flat converted to a three prime flat. Now the, the situation is very uh, different. When five prime is converted to three prime flat, the uh, three prime is very active. Polymerase can extend. As long as you have six, some secondary structure in the three prime flat, it will fall back as a helping structure. And then polymerase can actively extend this to make it a ligable site. So like this can ligate this together. So that is how alternative duplication come from. It's not a simple repeat. But uh, you have a space sequence that normally people don't know where they, this come from. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, we want to demonstrate uh, if uh, the city prime flap is really there. And we do, we, we do see this uniquely in the lab 27 mutation and uh, also uh, at 37 degree. Next slide. Um, two, two more slides, I think. <clears throat> I will not have that. So how could a reverse process be controlled? Can we control this? Yes. If we eliminate the cell cycle checkpoint, next slide, <clears throat> down one, uh, down one is overexpressed and activated in 37 degree. If we block this, um, knock out this gene, there's no more city prime flap, there's no more duplication, there's no more reversion. Next slide. And this makes me think about the cancer cell, how cancer cell survive. It's associated with the mutation burden and it become drug resistance. I, I hope that the information I delivered to you to make you think. And we did quite a bit of work. I'm running out of time to tell you about this. And I, the last slide. I want to thank people who did the work, my long-term senior associate, Dr. Li Zheng, and Postdoc the fellow Hita Sun did uh, most of this work I have been showing you today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Um, we're like I say, we'll take uh, questions at the end. We've got one more talk. And um, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Ji Zhang. He's chief physician, um, Chang Zhang Scholars, distinguished professor and the department director at the Hematology Medical Center at uh, Jingkou Hospital, Army Medical University in China. He's a standing committee member of the hematology branch and hematology physician branch of the Chinese Medical Association and deputy director of hematopoietic stem cell application group and chair of the hematology committee um, at his medical association. And so without further ado, on um, Zenkable Stem Cell Therapy and Graft versus Host, uh, Dr. Zhang. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, uh, I want to apologize because that's because he jumped out uncomfortable. So I, uh, I come here to give this um, presentation and um, replace him. Uh, Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's my great honor to, to uh, join the Global Oncology Symphonia held by City of Health International Medical Center. And uh, I'm from the 
Xinjiang Hospital, I mean Medical University, Chongqing, China. And the present presentation title for me today is the Medicine Chemo Stem Cell Therapy in Graft versus Host Disease. Uh, my presentation is divided into four parts. First one is some uh, brief overview. Uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, is an important method for the treatment of hematologic malignancies, including leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma, and severe autoimmune disease. The cure rate is up to 50 to 60%. But the graft versus host disease is the most common complication and death cause after transplantation. And the transplantation related mortality is up to 16%, according to the new East report from CIBMTR. And as we know, we usually take the immunosuppressive drugs, they are the main treatment for GVHD, but have obvious disadvantages. So we compare them as a double-edged sword with limited efficacy, but long-time use can lead to severe infection and organic dysfunction. So we want to find out a new way and a more effective way to control the GVHD. The mesenchym stem cells, we usually call it the pure important stem cell because it has the multi-directional differentiation potential and immune regulatory function. And the studies have confirmed that uh, MSA could reduce GVHD by regulating T and B cells function. The so part two is the MSC in the prevention and treatment of acute GVHD. Um, some meta analysis has shown that MSC is effective in preven preventing uh, acute GVHD, especially for severe acute GVHD. And in the inferior time of MSC had no significant effect on its preventative effect. Um, but other studies have also shown that um, the, preven the preventative effect of MSC of uh, acute GVHD needs to be further explored because some studies have shown that no significant differences were found uh, after the use of MSC. So in our center, we take the early infusion of MSC on the prophylaxis of GVHD study. We have two protocols, it's day zero protocol and the day 45 protocol. Uh, first, let's come have a look at the day zero protocol. Uh, we have the, we, we set this protocol on the routine GVHD prophylaxis at day zero infusion of umbilical cord MSC weekly and infusion once every two weeks and uh, uh, every four weeks. The dose is one million per kilogram and we enrolled 145 patients. And from the results, we can see no significant difference in the prevention of acute GVHD, but the day zero protocol could reduce the incidence of moderate and severe chronic GVHD. By the way, the day zero MSC protocol did not increase the relapse rate and had a similar non-relapsed mortality as the control group. It's our the day zero protocol results. For our day 45 protocol, uh, we uh, the study aggregated patients from totally five medical centers in Midwest China and totally 128 um, patients were enrolled after haploid transplantation in, into two groups. And from the results, we can see for GVHD, the occurrence of severe GVHD rate was 14.9% 14, was 14 in the MSA group, whereas 32.4% in the control group. The chronic GVHD was 27 versus 43.2% in the MSA and the control group. Um, besides, we can notice that the, for the severe acute and chronic GVHD, and it is decreased from 2.6 and 5.4 versus 13.5 and 17.5% between the two groups. And for the day 45 protocol, we analysis the GRFS defined as the viable without severe acute GVHD systematic treatment required chronic GVHD relapse or death. We found that the one-year GRFS was significantly decreased from 65.6 uh, 
to 43.7 between the MSC and the control group with significant difference. For the mechanism, we conduct the lymphocyte analysis and find that after MSC infusion, the number of NK cells in the MSC group decreased compared with the control group, and the T regulation increased in the MSC group. So we conducted that um, the repeated infusion of MSC from day 45 day after upload transplantation is an appropriate designation and a safe, more effective strategy to prevent chronic GVHD as well as acute GVHD. And it's our, um, our center's data. So let's move to the other, other studies about the serial resistant acute GVHD. And we found that they show that the bone marrow MSC is a promising therapy in the pediatric steroid refractory acute GVHD. But some studies also show that the, um, the efficacy is unstable. So is there any factors need to be further explored? Let's see the uh, first factor, maybe the age. Uh, they found that the the MSC could get the more effective treatment in the uh, for acute GVHD in children better than the adults. And for the sensitivity of organ, and they show that patients with skin acute GVHD respond better to MSC. And for the dose, even they uh, divided they, uh, they divided into low dose and high dose, and uh, there is a stronger decreasing treat for the RG3 alpha after high dose MSA, and they showed that there was a decreasing trend of GVHD score in the high dose MSA infusion. And they also find that the um, patients with the higher number of prior treatments were less likely to reach uh, CR after MSA treatment. For the MSA donor, they found that MSA from younger donors have better efficacy in the treatment of acute GVHD. And for the MSA therapy interval, they found that the duration for, uh, from first line serial therapy to second line MSA therapy affects the day 28 overall response. And some, um, some, some researchers have tried to the combination research that MSA combined with baliximide and the casinurin inhibitor in the treatment of serial resistant acute GVHD and it's an open-label multi-center prospective phase three trial designation. And they found that the overall survival and uh, the failure of survival is better in the MSA treating group than the control group. So let's move to the part three. It's about the MSA in the prevention and the treatment of chronic GVHD. First, let's have a look at our work to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of core-derived MSC in the prophylaxis of chronic GVHD. It is phase two multicenter randomized double-blind controlled study. We enrolled 124 patients and uh, 62 patients per group accepting umbilical core derived MSC, we use the we use the 30 million one per one time per month and four times in urine totally after the 90 post transplantation. Our primary objective is the incidence and the severity of chronic GVHD. Um, from the results we can see that after MSC in urine, the incidence of chronic GVHD decreased by 21.6 and there is non-GVHD occurrence in lung. For the mechanism study, we, adapt, we conducted the immune subsets analysis, and we found that after MS infusion, the Th1 and Trx subsets increased, whereas the Th2 and NK subsets decreased. It is the first reporting and published on GSO. Let's move to other um, studies about MS in chronic GVHD. First, uh, some studies also show it is uh, MSC is effective in prophylaxis of chronic GVHD. And for the uh, some the other meta 
meta analysis also also confirms that um, that the that the MNC prevention is effective. Uh, but for the steroid uh, resistant chronic GVHD, and some study use the one million per kilogram MSC and find that MSC is a promising therapy in patients with SR chronic GVHD. And for the for another phase two study, it also found that MSC infusion is effective. And they proposed the CL6, CL9, and 6 CL10 as early biomarkers for responsive responsiveness for the GMSC treatment. Uh, for for uh, for China, because there is more large, uh, is more pa more patient to suffering to accepting the haplo identical uh, transplantation. So we also conducted the MSC treatment for multi drug resistant chronic GVHD and find that MSC infusion is safe and effective therapy for MRD GVHD after the half low transplantation. Since the chronic GVHD could affect multi organs, including eye and the small intestine or skin, so some research conducts the research to see the treatment and the refractory chronic ocular GVHD with human umbilical cord MSC Axon, and they found that the I, the MSC axon eye drop treatment is safe and effective therapy for patients with GVHD associated severe dry eye. It could relieve the cornea epithelial damage and uh, relieve the dry eye symptoms and no obvious effect on the intracular pressure. And the research from Professor Liu also showed that the MSC infusion is effective in controlling the bronchiolitis obturin syndrome after all HACT and found that the re, um, the risk of the risk of FEV decline is is um uh, is lower in the MSC group and the mechanism was located in the CD90 B T Rex CD90 positive B Rex proliferation and differentiation. So from the um, studies above, we can see that the uh, mesenchymal stem cell therapy is effective, but the source, number, and time of MSC and doses varied. So what's the best infusion time point need to be verified? And how to treat the and define organ-specific MSC therapy? And is there any biomarker-guided MSC therapy? And other start, there is other studies to to want to want to uh, so so set the release criteria uh, among the different medical centers. So let's move to the last part: the prospective and the challenges of MSC therapy therapy in transplantation. First, from uh, we concluded that the unstable with MSC therapy and including the different source, quality, infusion message, and uh, it, it, we, it made all due to the heter heterogeneity of MSC, so leading to the unstable clinical outcomes of MSC therapy. And we, we can see from the research to show the current status of clinical trials assessing MSC for GVHD and the a lot of studies and different status of clinical trial and the subject composition and MSC oranges of clinical trials. And we can see that different, uh, different research may have the different results and the different dose. Um, so in our center, and we think uh, we, we, are, we are focusing on the research about the MSC repairing the marrow micro environment because the MSC and the, and the in, in epithelial cells were the two important parts to construct the micro micro uh, the bone marrow micro environment and our center from our center and our our thinking is to use the MSC dominant functional subsets and combine the cells to cooperate 
enhance the ability of repairing bone marrow environment to stabilize the treatment efficacy of mesenchymal stem cells. So we and our collaborators have achieved some uh, amazing results. First, uh, we can find that MSCs with uh, advantages in bone marrow microenvironment repair capacity. And uh, we identify and validate the dominant MSC subcluster to help reconstruct the hematopoiesis after transplantation and found that the dominant MSC could promote engraftment and uh, um, promote hematopoietic reconst reconstitution after uh, transplantation. And another collaborator has shown that the endocellular progenitor cells um, could maintain the structure and function of a marrow microenvironment. So if we combine the MSC and the EPC together, the study shows that it can prevent and treat GVHD better. And from our center, we use the single cell trans transcriptome sequence analysis of uh, 135,000 MSCs from multiple tissues, including umbilical cord, bone marrow, fat, dermis. And we found that the umbilical cord specific subgroup C4 was identified. And after deep analysis, um, the biological information analysis have shown that the KRT8 and the CRIPS LD2 could be used as a marker to define the specific C4 subset of MSC. And we conducted the analysis to, to, to see that the C4 subcluster of umbilical cord derived MSCs had a stronger immune regulation ability. Um, including they have the significantly overexpressed immunosuppressive cytokine and the lower immunogenity related genes. So it's our uh, it's our whole map to uh, further research on cell therapy to repel the marrow microenvironment and prevent the complications of HSAT about the failure in hematopoiesis and uh, immune complication including GVHD or relapse. So um, conclusion is that MSC is safe and e effective in the prevention and treatment of GVHD, but how to stabilize the efficacy need further study. Um, so so we, we all concluded that um, we want to identify the MSC efficacy in the controlling the transplantation communication. We need multi-center clinical studies and to combine with other centers to conduct the clinical trials. And the randomized trials is also needed. Uh, so we want to thank the collaborators, including the City Hope Dr. Dr. Zhen and the University of California, Dr. Zhong Jiangfan, and uh, our collaborator, including the Samin Wang, Ji Shi Wang, Jing Liu, and uh, all collaborators from our Xinjiang hospital. Finally, we want to thank all patients and their family to participate in this clinical trials. Uh, thank you very much. My presentation is over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And we're very glad that um, you could sub in for Dr. Zhang. Um, so uh, since you know we're we're talking about uh, science in the context of global oncology, I wanted to kind of circle back to the speakers and let's start with um, Dr. Shones. So you showed us some beautiful work and involving glycnaculation of DNA MT1 and you're defining these, you know, molecular signatures. But I also know that you've done some, some work in populations. So maybe do you wanna to talk to um, the, the conference about how you and your collaborators use epigenetic marks to kind of look at um, population health as we think about the global obesity epidemic and its implications in cancer? Sure, uh, thanks, it's a great question. Um, yeah, so I, I wanna start by saying that all of, um, uh, we are definitely, you know, the epigenetic component of this, and we've been collaborating with labs like Vicky Seavolt, um, who have been looking at um, 
you know, the more population based aspects of these, but yeah, um, there, there are several populations, um, you know, that are at, at increased risk for diabetes and obesity, and then also, you know, aggressive, um, cancers like triple negative breast cancer. Um, and you know, the, there's now, um, you know, 20 some cancers that have been associated, uh, with obesity. And, um, I, it, obviously these are very complicated systems, but I think it, one, you know, plausible molecular mechanism is that epigenetic modifications that are being altered by a direct result of metabolic diseases, um, are increasing risk for, um, cancer development. So, you know, it, it does, I think, provide, um, some potential, um, uh, opportunities, you know, we can measure, um, like oclic activation, um, from blood, mm -hmm. um, pretty straightforwardly. And, you know, it doesn't require, you know, any sort of fasting, um, um or anything. So, um, I, I think, you know, that those next steps are, are, are right around the corner, hopefully, and, yeah. and we would be able to do stuff like that. Yeah. It's exciting, right? Because even if it's not in every case, a driver of disease, right. If, you're lowering the burden of metabolic stress and you lower the burden of some of these biomarkers or the extent of these biomarkers that could be a way to track people's metabolic health in mm -hmm. addition to their BMI, their A1C and yep. some of the other things that we, in fact, A1C itself, you could argue is an epigenetic mark, right? It's a modification of a protein that um, you know, bears a memory of, uh, of, of, of blood, blood glucose. Um, I wanted to then, uh, turn to, to Dr. Shen. Um, I know you, you, you're a leader in these molecular events in, in DNA repair. And is there a way that you can connect, um, some of the things that you've been doing in the laboratory to, um, populations and health disparities in the area of, of lung cancer? Thanks, uh, Charles. So this is a very good question. That, um, uh, so the laboratory has a, a, a couple of pro other projects. And one of them is a non-small cell, non-carcinoma um, uh, project. You know, as you know, that um, portion of the non-small cell, non-carcinoma cancer was caused by uh, EGFR um, mutations. And it was a game of function mutations because in the mutation activated tyrosine kinase activity. And the first targeted drug was developed based on these mutations. Um, so the tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, has uh, now developed into a third generation. Uh, Tagliso works very well for this um, a portion of the, the cancer. But the problem is uh, uh, drug resistance. After 18 months of treatment, the lung cancer actually uh, metastasized to the brain. And this time you have no way to save a uh, patient's life. And this uh, particularly frequently in the Asian women. And it's a, it's a, it's a terrible uh, disease. You know, I lost a couple of uh, my colleagues uh, who work in City Hope. And uh, so we have been working on this. How can we prevent drug resistance? Uh, and this, uh, you know, the work I described to you, it's a uh, really mimic this process. As you can see, the you know, high temperature makes cell dies, but some of cell can still survive. A uh, key event is, uh, of course, uh, polymerase, uh, polymerase uh, mutations, second mutations. But this requires a checkpoint activation, the cell cycle checkpoint activation, which is one of the genes called DAM1, which is equivalent to check one and check two uh, in the memorial series. So now we are trying a, a combination of check one, check two um, inhibitors with uh, Tagliso. And it works very well in animal models in cell lines. So since February, we put on this uh, clinical trials and we currently have like three patients in load and so far the treatment uh, prolong the, uh, the time 
before the drug disease, we don't know how long it can go on. But uh, that's what we are doing. We try to enroll more patients from the yeah. Orange uh, County. Well, that's exciting. I mean, as people have noted earlier in the catchment area for City of Hope, we have a very high Asian population. So we're hoping that some of this work at City of Hope will have an impact globally in terms of the lung cancer burden. And I guess we'll give the last um, word to uh, Dr. Wang. So, um, you know, you may know that um, going forward in the strategic plan for the City of Hope Cancer Center, um, cellular therapies are actually, you know, something that we really want to focus on. So could you tell us a little bit more about the collaborations between your institute and City of Hope that relate to cellular therapies? Mm, sure, thank you for the question. And uh, for the collaborating uh, with the City of Hope, um, actually we have the set up the collaboration with Dr. Dufton. So for the research um, on the GVHD and in autoimmune disease. For the autoimmune disease, and we, we collaborate the research about the type one diabetes and the two after the heart flow identical transplantation. And, and, for, and for me, because I have been in city health for two years. So my study is, um, is about the GVHD prevention study in, um, in the lab and the way um, we do, we mainly focus on how to um, control the acute on the chronic GVHD, and we use the genetic mice and the genetic knockdown mice to analysis, and we found that this in my study, and we found that this that three knockout mice uh, could could uh, um, prevent GVHD and uh, keep uh, preserve the GVL. So my study is in this direction with the with C12. And our yes, our future direction for the collaboration is want to uh, see the maybe the more effective method to control the GVHD or um, to conduct on the patients because our study want to transfer from the experimental stage to the patient stage and it's our for final purpose. So we hope that the, we can um, have more collaboration. So okay. thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I know it's very late uh, for you in, in China now. So thank you for participating. So I'm going to turn it back to uh, Dr. Ogembo. Um, thanks everybody for, for this session.